We made some pretty big mistakes when setting up this DIY off-grid solar power system. We've been living completely off-grid for nine months now since starting our homestead. And it's not like we didn't do a ton of research before building all of this, but I wish I'd seen a few more videos like this one. So in today's video, I'm gonna share with you the top three mistakes we made and what I'm gonna do to fix them. Well, one of the most critical elements of our entire system is all of the really expensive gear that goes into making a solar power system work. That includes the inverter, the solar charge controller, and all of these connections, the battery of course they're one of the most expensive components and we knew straight away that one of our primary objectives with all of this gear was to protect it protect it from the elements from rain from heat from all of the things that could go into making electronics work less efficiently and not last as long essentially so we knew we had to position all of this gear as close to the solar panels as possible for two reasons. One, you've got to consider voltage drop. So you've got two lines that you're running. There's the line of low voltage from the solar panels to all the gear. That's how the energy is collected and then processed by this equipment. And then there's the line that runs from the inverter to your buildings and that's your mains power line. So we knew regardless, this gear had to be set up here out in the field where the solar panels are and it's the most exposed area. Of course it is because we want the most sunlight reaching our solar panels, but it means potentially heat, um, direct sunlight, and weather like rain getting into this equipment. So I knew I needed to weatherproof it and we bought one of these little kit sheds. It was enough to get started with and when we were setting up, it was kind of heading into the cooler part of the year, so it wasn't a big deal. I just needed a shed, literally just big enough to mount all of this gear on a board to be able to house the batteries. They're just down below here and keep it out of the weather essentially. But as I said before in a previous video where we talk about this entire setup, what it cost and how we did it, I knew I was gonna have to upgrade this shed at some point. And so as we start to approach the warmer parts of the month, Month, we're really seeing that as becoming a problem. We're getting days now where we're in the 30 plus degrees, that's Celsius, so you know that in Fahrenheit. In fact, we're in the middle of a heat wave right now. Today's likely to be about 38, 39 degrees. I knew I was gonna want to provide electronic ventilation systems and we'll probably still do that, but the biggest challenge I had was I wanted to put shade on this shed structure. So I had two options in front of me. Either I had to relocate this shed structure and I've got a stand of trees about 20 meters in that direction where I could have relocated it to, it would have provided some shade onto it, but that added further complications. I was gonna to have to cut my mains power lines and kind of rejoin and redirect those, and I really didn't wanna do that. Or I was gonna to need to be able to provide shade for this structure. And this is where thinking resourcefully comes into it as a homesteader. A good friend of mine was doing some major backyard renovations and he had this carport structure and said to me, could I use it out here on our farm? Well, regardless, you can always use a structure like this in a homestead and I knew exactly where I wanted it to go. So we resurrected this carport directly over this little tiny shed and I can tell you it's already made a massive difference. Even as we were up there the other day putting the roof sheets on this carport structure, it was baking hot, it was about 35, 36 degrees. As soon as I stepped here under the shade, I could tell straight away it was gonna do the job for us. And it's really important because all of this electronic equipment, it's electronics. It doesn't like performing in the heat and that's why things like like your computers and sensitive electronic equipment have heat sinks and, and uh, fans in them to dispel the heat as much as they possibly can. You might even be able to hear the whirring of some of the fans in the background there behind me. And it's only about eight o'clock in the morning right now. So already it's warming up in there and that electronic equipment is trying to disperse heat as efficiently as it can. So a future upgrade I might do in order to protect this equipment even further is we might completely enclose this structure, remove it all from this tiny little shed, mount it in here, insulate this structure and put an air conditioning unit in here, but we'll see how we go for this summer. The other thing, the other reason that you want to really look after your gear as far as heat's concerned is it just lengthens the lifespan of it. So our batteries, for example, which were almost half the cost of our overall system, they say they've got a five year warranty and a 10 year lifespan, and they say they can operate up to 50 degrees Celsius, but why would I wanna play with the extreme end of that range? If I know that electronic equipment and especially batteries performs better when it's kept cooler or at a more even temperature, why wouldn't I just try and give those batteries the best environment possible to not only perform more efficiently, but also last longer. 
Well, one of the biggest considerations when setting up an off-grid power system like this is of course shadows. And it's not necessarily that we made mistakes when it came to shadows, although there is one mistake and I'll explain that in just a moment, but it also comes down to how your shadows behave throughout the seasons. And you really can't know that until you've lived in the space for an entire set of seasons. In fact, on one of my earlier videos, I think I made some comment along those lines that before committing to fixed infrastructure, you really wanna study the seasons of your environment so that you can decide on things like shadows, on things like the way water flows, on things like wind and how that changes throughout the year. All of those environmental considerations should go into your overall homestead design, but especially when it comes to shadows and your solar power system. And I remember getting some idiot comment back saying, I oh, just use your eyes, mate, that's what they're for. And I thought, how dumb is that? You honestly don't know how the shadows are gonna behave until you've got the data and the details for that. So we made a really intentional effort to mark out the shadows throughout autumn, winter, and now spring here. And I've got a fairly good idea of how summer's gonna go, but summer's the easiest month. The shadows are the shortest because the sun is more overhead. But what really surprised me was the length of our winter shadows. I mean, some of the shadows from our trees were 30 or 40 meters longer than they were even in the autumn. And so they really started to spill out and across onto our solar panels. We knew we needed to keep them away from trees as much as possible. And so we left a fair gap to the north of them. Again, remember we're in the southern hemisphere, so our sun's in the north, which means our shadows cast south. And so we left this nice big space in front of them, but even still, as we got into the height of winter, some of those shadows started to really encroach on our solar panels. Now, the mistake I made was not figuring out exactly where true north was. Well, I mean, we did, but then I made an assumption. When we started to set up our solar panel arrays and rack them all up, I looked at our tiny home and I had thought that we'd put our tiny home north south but with an easterly outlook. We sort of did but actually we chose the outlook of our tiny home based on looking straight down onto the dam because we wanted the view and so we were a little bit askew of a north-south orientation for our tiny home and I forgot about that when we set up our solar panel arrays. So they were in alignment with the tiny home but actually they were probably nearly 45 degrees off north and that makes a massive difference. The most efficiency you're going to get out of your solar panels is by aiming them directly north. If you're in the southern hemisphere directly south if you're in the northern hemisphere because the sun spends the bulk of its time north of the solar panels yes it rises in the east yes it sets in the west and so there's an argument to be made for having solar panels tilted that way or this way but overall the best uh, most efficient method is to aim all your solar, solar panels north now because I was slightly off north I was a little bit northwest that meant that as we got into the summer months it kind of seemed like our sun as it was rising more and more into the summer months was rising a little bit south of my solar panel arrays and that was causing me number one a little bit of confusion and a bit of consternation as well because I was getting these shadows from two trees that were positioned right behind our solar panel arrays and I thought we could back those arrays right up to those trees with no worries at all because they were south of the arrays they were never going to cast shadows forward they would always only cast shadows backwards but in our morning hours particularly up to about 10 10 30 in the morning I was getting these shadows come straight down onto some of our solar panels and we've got older panels which means partial shading is a massive consideration if one panel is shaded by 20% it's like the entire array of panels is shaded by 20% that's how that works and so we were getting these shadows coming straight down onto the arrays and I couldn't figure out I went out there with my compass and realized we were off because we were pointing a little bit northwest that meant the Sun was coming up almost behind the solar panels and yes it was casting shadows straight down onto them. So number one, those trees had to go because that is the ideal location for my arrays. But also I've got trees like this big massive one here. And yes, it's marked for being taken down because not only have I got shadow problems that it's causing, particularly in the winter months, but also this big beautiful ironbark tree is gonna go to our sawmill and it's gonna produce some massive big beams and posts for some of the structures that we're gonna produce around here. But it had the potential to fall on our solar panels, which are only about 50 meters that way. So we've made a summer move of our solar panels we've relocated them out of the shadows of some of these bigger trees and that also means it's out of the fall zone of this tree I, I'm gonna try and make it fall that way but you know it doesn't always go exactly to plan when felling trees speaking of which I got a little bit cocky when dropping these two trees that were directly behind the solar panel arrays one of them fell exactly how I wanted it to the other one 
I just, you know, I've dropped dozens and dozens of trees before. They almost always fall exactly where I want them to, but I had such good success with the first one that I didn't even pay attention to the volume of tree that was leaning out over our solar panel arrays, and this happened. So yeah, even the most experienced chainsaw operators can get it wrong. Don't get cocky, think twice, you know, the whole measure twice, cut once, well, look twice, chainsaw ones, and especially when you're doing it around expensive equipment. I was really lucky nothing got damaged, it was only a small tree, but that could have been disastrous. So right now I'm in the middle of not only relocating our entire array to be out of the shade of some of those trees that I talked about, but also facing true north, and you'll see I was way off, like I said, I was almost 40, 45 degrees off, and as we laid them out and then as we fixed that orientation, we realized just how much of that northern sunlight we were missing out on. But the other thing that I'm fixing here is our tilt and the reason that tilt is important and the mistake that I made was not paying close enough attention to it the reason that it's important is to do with how the Sun is positioned in orientation to your solar panels so let me explain it this way I've got this spare solar panel I'm gonna lie it out here flat on the ground if I was directly above that solar panel looking down on it the solar panel looks like a rectangle that's the shape and size that it is but the Sun is never directly above your solar panels I mean, unless you are right on the equator line, the sun's a little bit away from you. If you're in the northern hemisphere, the sun is south of you. If you're in the southern hemisphere like us, the sun is north of you, even in the summer months. So we're in the southern hemisphere. In fact, we're on the 27 degree latitude line. And so one of the best ways to understand that is if I fly my drone back now away from the solar panel into the north part of the sky, you'll see that it almost appears like that solar panel decreases in length. It goes from being this full-size rectangle to almost becoming like more of a square. The further I get away from it, the more it shrinks in size. And if you think about that, that means that effectively, if I shrink my solar panel or cut a section of it off, I'm not able to produce as much power. So the further I get away, especially into the winter months, the more that effect becomes obvious. All right, here's how to get around that. And this is why solar panels are tilted. You basically follow a simple formula. If you want to set the tilt of your solar panels at a fixed angle all year round. It's basically your latitude, like I said, ours is 27 degrees, and that's the front angle of your solar panels. So I could set my solar panels at 27 degrees, and year round I'd be getting a pretty even amount of sunlight distributed onto them. But obviously in the summer it's going to move further up onto them, and in the winter it's going to move further away from them, and so that effect of losing power because I'm losing surface area of the solar panel gets a little bit amplified in those summer and winter months. So what I can do is pick three different angles and adjust for those throughout the year. Autumn and spring are going to be the same angle, they're going to be that 27 degrees for me or whatever your latitude is, but for summer I want to go minus 15 degrees and for winter I want to go plus 15 degrees. So my summer angle is actually only about 12 degrees and you can see that on the panels behind me. Right now about half of them are still laying flat, we're in the process of just making new legs up for them that pop that angle up to only 12 degrees, which is actually pretty close to flat on the ground. The mistake I made was not realizing how far off of the winter angle I had set them to. And so we had done this calculation as we were approaching winter and the legs I made for the back of my solar panels were optimized for a winter angle of 42 degrees. Well, 42 down to 12, that's a 30 degree difference. And so essentially as the sun moved further and further overhead, I was really missing out on a lot of that summer sun. All right, so nuts and bolts, what does this all mean practically? And what does it mean practically to you? I mean, you might not make the same mistakes that I've made, but you can certainly learn the lessons that I've learned. Just before I share with you some key takeaways from this experience, can I ask you to consider subscribing to our channel? If you found this video useful, if you wanna see more content like this from us, or if you wanna follow along on our homesteading journey. We've only been out here for nine months and we're setting everything up from scratch. So if you wanna follow that story, then hit subscribe now. Okay, some key takeaways from this experience. The first thing I would say is be flexible with your infrastructure where you can. We've developed a homesteading philosophy of not using concrete and not welding steel when we don't have to but committing to that fixed infrastructure later on if we can. Now sometimes you don't have that opportunity when you go to build your house at some point you've got to pour the slab you've got to lay the foundations and you've got to get to building but where you can allow time and experience to inform your decisions you don't want to be locked into fixed infrastructure and that has saved us more times than not and so wherever possible I try not to lock things into the ground or 
weld things together so that I can change things around as I learn more about them, as I learn more about the environment that impacts my systems. So a practical example of that is we allowed the length of cable between our solar panels and our solar equipment shed to be just a little bit longer than it needed to be. I knew I'd experience a tiny percent in voltage drop, but not much, and enough that it allowed me the flexibility to move my solar panels around and find the ideal location and orientation for them, and I'm glad we did that. The second thing I would say is develop a mindset of paying attention to how your equipment works and how you work with it and how your environment works around your equipment. So practically, like I said, we marked shadows on the ground every single month with line marking paint and with pegs so that we could learn exactly how our shadows behaved throughout the year. The other thing we did is we paid for the optional extra of a remote monitoring system for our solar power system. So we paid for the screen so I can go inside that shed there and look at a readout anytime on how the system's performing. But I also paid for the device that allows us to stream that data over the internet and I can literally check from my iPad, my computer, wherever I am in the world, how my system's doing. And that's enabled us to develop a, um, a habit, if you like, of watching our system and seeing how it performs and learning how it responds to environmental factors, to our own power usage. Today, for example, I have noticed it's only 10 o'clock in the morning. In the small changes that we've made, we've generated an extra half a kilowatt hour in just the first three hours of generating power of the morning. That's actually huge. So let me put that in practical terms. If you're not used to using solar power yet and kind of monitoring your energy in terms of kilowatt hours, that would mean I could turn the coffee machine on a half an hour extra in the morning, or I could use the slow cooker for an extra hour of the day. So those small power differences are gonna make huge differences to the way we use our energy throughout the day. And those are the gains I was hoping to get from making some of these tweaks. The third takeaway piece of advice I would give you is be flexible not only with your infrastructure, but be flexible with your mindset. In other words, develop just a little humility to say, do you know what, I don't know everything, but I'm gonna give myself the opportunity to tweak, make adjustments, to admit where maybe I got it a little bit wrong, but be able to change and develop a more efficient system because of that. So I hope you found this video useful and we hope to see you again on the next one.